Well, for a while I've been sort of off and on meditating on, uh, you know, three words, sin, transgression, and iniquity. So I don't know how well I'll do or how far I'll get, but uh, we'll, we'll kind of keep that in mind and use it as a springboard to see where this all leads. Personally, uh, I believe there's many times you can use the word sins and sin interchangeably. All right? You know, you want to, uh, some people perceive sins as individual acts of wrongdoing, sins, and then they perceive sin as a general state of unbelief. But scripturally, by scriptural definition, sin, singular, sin is the transgression of the law. So, to try to distinguish the word sin from sins and kind of separate them, one is a performance of bad deeds and the other one is a state of, of belief. It doesn't, if you, if you go if you look at all the scriptures that say sin and sins, it, it doesn't hold up. Hmm. It, that idea does, doesn't hold up. So, John 8.34 says, Jesus answers them and says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin, and here's my first example, sin, singular, is something that is committed. So it goes beyond a thought. It goes beyond the sort of the esoteric, I guess, or the, the mental or the unseen or the belief or the mind or the spirit. You're actually committing sin. Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And uh, just keep that in the back of your mind as we relate it to Romans 6 and 7. Well, certainly Romans 6. I'm going to go through all that again. And So we have three words, sin, transgression, and iniquity. There's a couple of scriptures that have all three words in them. So for interest's sake and what have you, I'm, I'm going to read those. Exodus 34, 7, describing the attributes of God keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. No doubt before we are saved and before we are filled with the Holy Ghost and entered into a covenant with God, and no doubt amongst the heathen, this is, this is what happens. Quite often, uh, wrongdoing, sins, evil spirits that uh, dominate a man or a woman can get passed down from generation to generation. You know, for homosexuals who want to say they were born that way, well, I don't know if that's an, a valid explanation for it, but it goes beyond homosexuality. But in the end result, we're, we're not so much born that way, as we have things passed down to us by one man, Adam, sin entered into, into the world and sin and death came on all of us. Right? We didn't have a say in it. It came, it came on us. But now we have opportunity to repent. We have opportunity to uh, be reconciled to God. And those of us who are saved knows that God, no matter how you try to uh, uh, analyze or think through the cause and effect and how and the mechanics of it and how does God accomplish all this for me that's not important God leaves man without excuse one way shape or form so you can't have things that are visited upon the children from the fathers but I think there's a scripture in Ezekiel that says uh, they had a proverb in Israel and they said uh, the father have Fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the, therefore the children's teeth are set on edge. And God said, you're going to have no more occasion to use this proverb anymore. And this is the kind of law we're in now, with the law of Christ and with the age of grace and everything else, and with the outpouring of the Spirit of God for the last 2,000 years, you know, I'll pour out my Spirit upon all flesh and all of that, is that uh, every man will die for his own sin and for his own iniquity. Right? So, so it becomes the individual thing again. We shall all give an account. Now, who did sin this man or his parents? You know, there's more to the issue of sin than narrowing it down to who sinned this man or his parents. 
Well, what I'm saying is it's, a, it's an issue to be dug into a little bit. Sin and transgression and iniquity. But sin is the transgression of the law. So, well, here's another scripture in 1 John 5, 17. All unrighteousness is sin. sin. Not sins. All unrighteousness is sin. sin. And there is a sin not unto death. Jesus, when he's being delivered up to be crucified, the Jews deliver him to Pilate, and uh, he says, uh, They that delivered me unto thee, he said, hath the greater sin. 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 It was an action and a deed of offense against the law of God. All right, and another scripture. Let's just define the words. So keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that while by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. Sin is just an offense or an act, a deed of offense. The word transgression has more of an implication of rebellion or transgression, rebellion, trespass. And it's derived from another word which is uh, identified with the idea of expanding yourself. You think of the wicked man, spread himself like a green bay tree. It, through the idea of expanding yourself and to break away from authority. So this is interesting because Daniel in chapter 9 talks about the transgression. Daniel 9, 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. And we know that the uh, through revelation and getting theological and what have you, and like I always say, there is a true theology if you want to look at it that way, in other words, there's a true expounding of God's purpose that, that goes way beyond what the Scripture says at face value to encompass His eternal purpose, to fill in a lot of blanks that is that we call, call that theology. Lucifer in heaven, he was the first creature to exercise his I will. And that is the transgression. That is the transgression. The transgression is the exercise of the will deliberated, consciously moving against God. And so in so doing, the activating of his will, the exercise of his will, I will, and, and even more specifically, I will ascend. Right? I will ascend. I will be like the Most High, which is a deliberated act of a presumptuous will that is breaking off from its status in communion with God. So that's, that's the word transgression. Now if you look at the word sin, I mean we can commit sin. Sin is the transgression of the law. Law is a description of righteousness, right? The Ten Commandments. Even though by the deeds of the law, no man, no flesh shall be justified, yet the deeds of the law will be fulfilled in us if we die off to the old man, go through the operation of God, and Christ comes forth in our flesh. Hopefully I'll cover that a little bit later. That even though the deeds by the deeds of the flesh shall no man be justified in the sight of, the, of God, it doesn't mean that the flesh does not have to do what is righteous. There's still a requirement for the flesh to do what's righteous. Mm -hmm. It, right, you crucify the old man, Christ comes forth in you, and then you do what's in the law without deliberating it. You don't have to consciously think through every act you do to make sure it lines up with this verbal description or this written description. Just by nature, you will do what's in that law. Yeah. It, it's the nature of God coming forth. It's, it's the righteousness that's coming forth from within instead of a standard dictated upon you from without. Uh, that you keep with no particular understanding or without any particular or adequate reverence or love for God. All right? 
transgression introduces the idea of rebellion and revolt and breaking from authority. He's going to finish the transgression, whereas sin can be something. We can sin in ignorance. Do you know that? We can sin in ignorance. Go to the book of Numbers. I don't have it in my notes, but you know how it goes. If a man shall sin through ignorance, when the sin that he has committed shall come to his knowledge. So there's things we may do, and it's not a conscious, deliberate revolt against God, and yet it is a transgression of the law. Sin is the transgression of the law. And, and again, I say, go back to what I started with in John. Whosoever committeth sin, whosoever lets his flesh commits the action and deeds of sin, he is the servant of sin. You're not the servant of God, you're the servant of sin. sin. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal, mortal bodies. Consider yourself, reckon yourself, you are dead, dead to sin. You're alive unto God through righteousness. That's the mark. That's the mindset. Amen. And then iniquity. Well, when I th think of iniquity, well, here it is. Forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. Now, God's big enough that he can forgive all these things. He can forgive your sin. David in one place said, And thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. And the iniquity is just that state of being aware of self, doing things in for yourself or in reference to yourself, the idea of being self-centered, self-aware, self-motivated for self, that is the state of iniquity. And it is a state of being separated. We are uh, shapen in iniquity. We're born in sin. We're shapen in iniquity. This spirit of the world and the, the, the way we grew up and the influence of, uh, of the school system and the society and the world and the spirit of the world, well, what does America tell you? You pursue your, your life, your liberty, and your own happiness. That's the American dream. Life. Your, whose life? Your life. Liberty. Liberty. Liberty for what? To do whatever you want. And you have a right to pursue your happiness. Well, that's all about self, right? Self, self, self. Fundamentally, as they say in the garden, before the fall, Adam had communion with God. His awareness was God. His communion was with God. When they partook of the fruit and they transgressed the commandment that God gave them, that was breaking away from submission to the authority of the commandment God gave. They transgressed. They sinned and they transgressed. And that broke them away from God. That separated them from God. So by default, conscious awareness comes off of God and conscious awareness comes onto themselves. Now they're in a state of iniquity. Oh, I'm naked. Well, who told you you were naked? Because before they were naked and not ashamed, right? Because they weren't aware of it. They weren't aware of any guilt or shame concerning nakedness. But now... The awareness comes off of God and the awareness comes upon themselves. That's the state of iniquity. It's how people say, well, I live for myself. They, YOLO, you only live once. So enjoy yourself. Have a good time. You know, do for your, every man for himself. And largely, I mean, to a certain degree, some people may be cultivated to think of others to a certain degree. But I'm just speaking in general terms and fundamental terms. So iniquity. You know what Jesus said about the end of the age? Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. You see that particularly in our part of the world, the end of the age, all the American stuff about rights. I have a right. The focus is on me. I have the right. I have the power. I have the liberty to do what I want. Liberty is perceived as doing what I want. That is cultivating iniquity. That, that is liberating iniquity. And as we taught before, if you remember some of the things we preached before, I preached before, what is Christian liberty? What Christian liberty is, is when the Christian wants to do what is right in the sight of God, but finds out he's in bondage to sin, and sin is oppressing him and bringing him and dragging him down and, and overwhelming him to do the thing that he doesn't want to do, so he does not have the power to fully submit to God because sin is in his members 
And there is a mystery of iniquity that's holding him in bondage to that power. And even though he doesn't want to do something evil, he's, he ends up doing it somehow. And he doesn't quite understand how or why, because it's the mystery of iniquity. But the whole thing is directing you to cry out to God for mercy and deliverance. And also teaching you that uh, when you are delivered and set free, it's because of God's power and not your own power. And we've talked over and over again how, how important it is for that counsel to be written in the table of your heart as you struggle with sin. So that's a, ne a necessity. But nevertheless, uh, so the liberty for the Christian is when you finally get to, to be, to, you finally get delivered, now your will has been set at liberty. Now that your will is set at liberty, you are free to lay it down for the will of God's sake. Okay, so worldly concept of liberty is why we're, we are at liberty to take up our will and pursue our life. Christian liberty is, oh, we have been empowered and we have been set at liberty to lay down our life and surrender our will. You understand? Uh, we related it to the statement of Jesus when he said, I have power to take up my life and I have power to lay it down again. And you think of that in terms of his physical life, which is true, and that's how you apply it to the, the, the scene of the crucifixion. But it also is relevant and applicable to describe our will. You know, you ha do you think you have the power to lay down your will in favor of doing God's will? You, know, and you go ahead and try it. And you find out as much as you want to, you're not able to perform it. Like Romans 7, I, I, I want to do good. I would like to lay down my will. But I got this other stuff tugging at me and I end up doing the evil I don't want to do. I don't have the liberty to lay down my life. That's really what it's saying. So Christian liberty is not about taking up the will. Christian liberty is about laying it down. Mm -hmm. Worldly liberty is about taking up the will. Christian liberty is about laying it down and forsaking the will. So we struggle to lay down our wills and we run into a problem with our bondage and with the good that we would, we do not, the evil that we would not, that we do, and we cry out to God, whatever, and we go through a deliverance. Now we are free. It's like I was saying last week, the woman caught in adultery. If, if the woman caught in adultery is akin to us, the church, struggling in sin, and we're doing things that are spiritually adulterous to God, worldly things, when we finally get set free, when God finally finishes writing on the table of our hearts, He says, go and sin no more. How many people perceive of it this way? Go ahead and sin no more like you wanted to. Mm -hmm. that now you are free, now you are at liberty not to sin. Mm -hmm. You see what the liberty is there? Yeah. You are now at liberty not to commit adultery. Now before you were under the power of sin and you didn't want to commit adultery, but you were oppressed, you were overpowered, you were forced. You didn't have the knowledge of God. You didn't have the empowerment of the Holy Ghost. You didn't have the experience. But now once God's finished with you, writing on the tables of your heart, bringing you through experiences and ups and downs and sorrows and cries of heart and, and godly sorrow and you're ready to repent and you know your sufficiencies of God and you have no hope unless God helps you and so he delivers you from that after all that preparation in your heart and he finally delivers you now be at liberty to go and sin no more <laughs> that's why I like to say it so the whole concept of Christian liberty is and worldly liberty are opposites people perceive that that Christian liberty is something like uh some liberation to the will. Well, no, because we just remember the whole basis of salvation is always submission or laying down the will or laying down your life. When Jesus says, I have power to lay down my life, I have power to take it up again, it meant he also, besides being the physical death and life, he also, what he's also saying is, you know, I have power to, I'm at liberty that I could exercise my will if I want to, Hey, I could call down 12 legions of angels and get out of this. I'm at liberty to exercise my will and with my authority call the legions of angels and get out of this crucifixion. I can do that. I'm at liberty. I can do that. I also have power to lay my life down, take the crucifixion, and let many other people get saved. Which one of the two is charitably? 
And which one of the two is iniquity? But Jesus did not do the iniquity. He had the, uh, he had the liberty to do iniquity. <laughs> and why is that? Because worship, that's what worship is all about. Worship is you have the liberty, but what, what are you going to do with your liberty? Are you going to take up your life? Or are you going to lay it down? See, the concept of liberty is just different than what people think. The concept of Christian liberty. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. Free from what? Free from the power of sin that you have to commit sins. That's why I'm going to say it. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free, and be not entangled again in the yoke of the bondage of sin. And we dealt with this before. I read it again in Romans 6. So sin, sin shall no longer have dominion over you. That doesn't mean that sin shall no longer have the dominion of penalizing you with death. And then after that, it doesn't matter whether you do good or evil. No, it means sin shall not have dominion over you that you don't have to obey sin and perform his evil deeds. Because we're getting back to the idea of, the, of fruit. What is fruit? By their fruits you shall know them. Well, what is the fruit? Well, remember, we're the trees of righteousness. If you have a tree of righteousness, the tree has a root. You have a root of faith, you have a root, you have a heart, and you have a root that goes to God, the throne of God. And what comes out of your heart? Out of the heart are the issues of life. What is an issue? An issue is a flow of spirit, spiritual movements, spiritual motions, spiritual forces. They proceed out of the heart, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and the mouth speaks words, and Jesus said, my words are spirit. You see all the correlation there. So you have a heart, it's like, the heart is like a container. Within the heart, you have issues, spiritual motions, issues. Those spirits proceed out of the heart, for from within, out of the heart, proceed. Adulteries, fornications, evil eye, blasphemy, thefts, murders. They're all spirit of murder, spirit of blasphemy, spirit of lying, spirit of adultery, spirit of this, spirit of that. Where do they come from? Where do they proceed out of? They proceed out of the heart. And then when they proceed out of the heart, where do they come into? Your flesh. Right? And then when they come into your flesh, what do they do? They perform a deed. Uh, they manifest. They produce an action. A thought, a word, a deed. A work. That's the fruit. That's the final result of the tree. The fruit. You plant a tree, of an apple tree. What's the final result of the apple tree? Yeah. The apple. Yeah. The fruit. Mm -hmm. What's the final result of all the heart and spiritual emotion that begins to proceed forth out of your heart and into the flesh. What's the final result? It's the action. It's the deed. That's the fruit. By their fruits you'll know them. By their deeds. By their lifestyle. The fruit's more than some kind of state of mind or some existence of some embrace of something in your mind or spirit. So what's ever in the heart has got to come out. got to be made manifest. By their fruits you shall know them. So think of that now in, in terms of fruit. Now you can speak about fruit in other contexts, like the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith, or whatever the list is. But when it's talking about by your fruits, you shall know them. Many times when it's talking about fruit, that's exactly what it's talking about. And doesn't it make sense? I mean, the natural allegory fits pretty good, doesn't it? You have a tree, it has a root, it grows forth. You know, and what you see, the part of the tree you see is, is what's above the earth. It comes out of the earth. So there's a part of us that's stuff that's in our heart, and that's what's under the, under the ground, right? And you have a root system that goes down into the ground, and that's our root system. And then you have a portion of the tree that you see, and that's our physical bodies, that, that's come, that you see on the earth. That's what you see. And then the tree finally has fruit. And uh, we sort of were feeding on off of each other. If we do good works one to another, we're eating fruit. We're eating fruit. So 
A corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. And a good tree cannot bring forth corrupt fruit. Whosoever is born of God, he can't bring forth corrupt fruit. He, he, he doesn't commit sin because he's been born of God. He's been through a process, an operation. He's agonized. He's cried out to God. He knows his, his sufficiency is of God. He knows he, it's God or he's, he's, or he's going to perish. And God honors it by breaking the bands of sin and letting the spirit of God's righteousness operate in his mortal body. And we, the way you know that, he that doeth righteousness is of God because you see the righteous actions and deeds in his body. Holy conversation, holy lifestyle. Iniquity abounds, the love of many shall back wax cold. That's what I got started with all that. Was uh, I don't know how I got there from this. From this but, um, but you can see the point. When iniquity abounds, uh, the love of many shall wax cold. And, you know, the chief characteristics of love are charity. Uh, even Jesus, who was the love of God in flesh, even Jesus pleased not himself. Love seeketh not its own. It's not wrapped up in self, all wrapped up in iniquity and everything else. And that's, you know, by and large, um, the distinction between God's true people and others who may be even spirit-filled and everything else. Many shall say to me in that day, Lord, have we not cast out devils? You have taught in our streets and we cast out devils in your name and we did many wonderful works in your name. Depart from me, ye that work. Iniquity. Iniquity. Because it wasn't God's ministry. It wasn't a ministry of reconciliation. It was, uh, you know, it was uh, Kenneth Copeland's ministry. It was so-and-so's so ministry. So it was iniquity. It was centered around self and religious self ideas and dead works and things that the gospel just simply doesn't teach. And those guys are out there now prophesying 2020 is the year of America's restoration and God's going to bless America financially and all this stuff. They're still on that that bandwagon. All right, so iniquity abounds, the love of many righteous cool. Iniquity. Now, iniquity is a lot more serious in general than just sin. But iniquity, by definition, is gross injustice or wickedness. The etymology of the word or how the word derived, where it came from. In iniquity, in is not, and aeacus or aqueus or something means not just or not right. It means you are not right. You're not being just. You're being wicked. And iniquity often is going to imply a great lack of moral or spiritual principle. We start to bring into the word perverseness. Now, we talk about sins. Okay, if I, uh, I might transgress against my brother, or let's say, uh, I leave the greenhouse door open by mistake and it gets cold and the, the orange trees die or something, right? Mm -hmm. That's not a particularly perverse thing. Yes, it's a lack of uh, awareness and everything else. It doesn't have a an, a an element of guile and wickedness and deceit in there, right? Now, it is a fault. It is a trespass. It is, you might even say that is not even particularly a transgression by the true definition of the word, uh, word because I wasn't trying to deliberately exercise my will and break from authority or anything like that. It was just an oversight, whatever it is. See, we're, there's a, we can really split hairs over the terms here. And I'm not really prepared to do a whole lot of that today, but I'm just going to introduce you to the uh, idea that we can take three words, sin, transgression, and iniquity. And we can zero in on them and talk about similarities and differences. So iniquity, yeah, iniquity is a little more serious. Let's go back to what I was saying. And thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Sometimes sin has a flow of, of iniquity. A selfish desire, a selfish ambition, something that uh, just doesn't care about how it affects others. And this is, this is what iniquity is. Iniquity is blind because iniquity is only in consideration of what I want. Right? And people have this uh, 
some people have this philosophy of life as, uh, well, what I do is my business as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. But who says you have the vision to even comprehend or perceive how it is hurting somebody else? We do things that hurt people and we don't perceive it because we're just focused on ourselves. We simply don't see it. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Now, what do you do when you're desperate? When you're desperate to save yourself, protect yourself, vindicate yourself, who's, who are you concerned about at that moment? Yourself. Who are you not aware of? Everything else. So in your desperation, uh, see, we're not even necessarily arguing bad intention, necessarily, but desperation, you're going to be blind, you're going to affect somebody in an adverse way, and you might walk away thinking you didn't hurt anybody, because you're just simply not aware of it. Just because you don't see how you hurt anyone, doesn't mean necessarily that you didn't hurt them. But this is the problem with iniquity. Iniquity makes everyone with a cultivates a focus on self, cultivates a blindness of what's around them, and eventually a state of varying degrees of seared conscience. Until I have a right becomes very perverse. It becomes iniquitous. Iniquity abounds. Thank you, United States, and your Charter of Rights, because you have made iniquity abound. Don't tell me God loves this nation, uh, not the state we're in now. Because that's what some of these false prophets are saying. God loves this nation. Well, you could say, well, God so loved the world. But how about now? How about 2,000 years of despising His grace? See, the, believe, uh, whether you believe it or not, the mindset of God, the attitude of God towards a nation, towards a person, towards people, goes through a progression. It goes through a progression. And the more and more you ignore God and despise His grace, the more and more you eat up the long-suffering until you grieve the heart of God. And then what comes after grief, as we've heard so many times? What pre yeah, wrath. Grief, and then finally, uh, the depth of grief finally gives way to wrath because it's the only expression of God left to, that can be expressed to fulfill all judgment and justice. And it must be expressed because everything must be come to a balance of judgment and justice. Hell hath no fury like a woman spurned. Well, you know, hell hath no fury like a God spurned. That's really what it should be. So iniquity is just, you know, the self-awareness, your pursuit of self, self-will, self-ambition, self-desire, the things that you want. Uh, the pride of life, getting something out of enjoy life, loving loving this life, iniquity. A while back, a long time ago, I preached something, and it was just, I'll, I'll throw this out for now. Um, Jesus gives the great invitation, right? Great invitation. Come unto me, all ye that are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, that invitation is given and is hearkened unto by people who are just tired of iniquity. They've suffered too much from it. It hasn't produced the result. They know they're empty. They know they need something more. They need a relationship with God. And they are. their hearts have been prepared. They are ripe to repent and turn to Jesus. So Jesus says, Come unto to me, all ye that are weak and heavy laden. In Isaiah, he says, Ah, oh, you uh, uh, sinful nation, a people laden. laden with. So are you weak? You're heavy laden. What you laden with? You know, the whoremonger in the church, a perverse authority, a perverse Christian, uh, he leaves captive, silly women laden with, yeah, laden with sins, laden with guilt and sin and sorrow, leaving, uh, a, leaving the woman in the desperate cry for comfort. And the whoremonger says, I'm going to capitalize on that. She's desperate. <laughs> I can move right in and I can take that. She will not resist because she's laden with so many sins. She is so weak. Well, the Bible doesn't say, come unto me. You know, if someone wants to be the uh, similitude of Christ, Christ didn't come along and said, come ye that are weak and heavy laden and I will give you sex. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. He said, I'll come, I'll give you rest. 
As we said before, that was the the, the uh, tragedy, the uh, the ex- exceptional wickedness of the sin of Hophni and Phinehas is that in the priest position, in the in the position of authority, intercepting the women who would have were supposed to go and worship God, and then receiving their worship in a sexual act. It became idolatry. It became robbing the glory of God. It was more than just an impulsive, one-time, adulterous sexual affair like King David and Bathsheba. So there's a difference between those two. And as you'll notice, God forgave David, but he destroyed Hophni and Phinehas. So deliberate pursuit of self-will, iniquity, iniquity. So that's why we want to meditate on charity and and those those aspects of charity. You know, have fervent, it's the only, it's the only thing that's going to get us through. We're going to just have to have charity. Nothing else is going to, going to do it. You know, um, morality and all that, that's all good and everything else. But have fervent charity among yourself. Charity shall cover and hide the multitude of sins. But there is a sin unto death, you know, and sin has degrees. And sin has motivational forces and factors. And some sin is committed in ignorance and some is not. Okay, so when you move into the idea of iniquity, you're moving more and more into the realm of wickedness where you, 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 uh, you deliberate what you're doing and either through unbelief, you, you don't believe it, it's, God thinks it's that bad or you don't believe you're really hurting anybody by this. But it is a deliberate thing, and it is a thing of self, and it is a thing of perverseness, and it gets eventually becomes immoral and perverse. Okay, but now we heard about the talk of iniquity and defining iniquity, that iniquity is identity too. Iniquity is identity. In other words, you have your own identity, which implies that the iniquity or the identity is what makes you distinctive and different from everybody else. Okay, now you can think of that in terms of physical appearance, which is evident. Hardly no two people look alike unless you're twins. And even uh, even twins, you can find subtle things that are a little bit different from one to the other. Think of it in terms of the unique and distinctive will that you have. Right? I don't exercise your will, and you don't exercise mine. And if God says, I want you to do this, and you surrender your will, and you do what God wants, then whatever you express is what God wanted. So therefore, you are expressing His image and not your own. And rebellion, by nature, thinks it has to assert itself and deliberate its will opposite of what anybody else tells it to, so I can maintain my uniqueness. And that's kind of the fundamental motivation of rebellion and self-will. So, again, the will, our, our identity or our life is hid with Christ in God. So, regardless of the fact, if we submit ourselves unto God, God is still going to let us have our identity but it's going to be hidden in Him. It's going to be in Him. And, and I always liked the, how we heard about Brother Simon, about how he preached that the devil wanted to be God, right? I will ascend, I will be like the Most High. And what the devil tried to attain through rebellion, Jesus Christ obtained by submission. So transgression, going back to the word transgression. Transgression is the word that brings into play by definition rebellion or revolt against authority and i believe that's why daniel puts it that way and daniel doesn't specifically say the transgression was lucifer but i'm i'm filling in the connecting the dots here what was the initial transgression satan i will and he came and he got man to do the same thing exercise the will against the known commandment because the conscience got seared by a fundamental lie. The fundamental lie is you shall not surely die. Okay? So what was the uh, essence of that fundamental lie? The God said, In the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. The devil says, You shall not surely die. I mean, God doesn't care about this act or deed that you do. You're not going to die. 
It's like people saying, oh, sin doesn't have the power of death over you, so whatever you commit in your flesh doesn't matter. In essence, it's the same thing. You shall not surely die. It's the same fundamental lie. And what's the effect? A seared conscience to God. Now, as much as I like to stick with Scripture, and, um, you know, I, as much as we preach on things like psychology and psychiatry, and that those things are just man's attempt to try to explain behavior and uh, good and evil and the way that things work in the soul of a man and the heart of a man, and that man can't know those things because only God knows the heart of a man. And as much as psychiatry and psychology are woefully inadequate and just... You know, the attempts of men to figure things out without God, yet they, they tag certain pa- patterns of behavior. So if you think of the word psychopath, the main characteristic of a psychopath is someone who has no empathy. He cannot relate to the weakness or pain of others. And he has no conscience. Couldn't care less of the effect of what he's doing on anybody else has no sense of pain or remorse or guilt or shame or care or concern about his own conduct towards other. He's he completely blinded, no conscience, seared with a hot iron, as Timothy puts it, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So we're saying the fundamental first step to searing a conscience The fundamental first step is this one fundamental counsel. Oh, you shall not surely die. Now, what other form would this counsel take? Now, that counsel, you shall not surely die, it may not take the form of those exact words in your mind. But how about this? Oh, it doesn't matter what I do in my flesh, good or evil, because... uh, sin no longer has dominion over me, the penalty of death is taken, it doesn't matter what I do in my body... In effect, you're saying, I shall not surely die. So you are emboldened not to go to war against sin in your mortal body. You just let it have its way. And that is the beginning of, or the fulfillment of, a seared conscience. So you have a fundamental lie. You shall not surely die. No. Whosoever commits the sin is the servant of sin. If you're serving the sin, you are not the servant of God. So, and he that committed sin is of the devil. devil. So then your father is the devil. And you, you're, you're a corrupt tree. You're not bringing forth good fruit. Every, good, every tree that does not bring forth good fruit is... <laughs> you're going to die. I mean die spiritually. I mean you're going to die. Your soul is going to die. It will be lost. They which do such things. How can you countervail that? See, it's conscience searing. And as the book of Jude said, the angels that sinned and left their first estate. It means they left off the function and the role that God created them for. A ministering man of God was created in in a role to minister the perfection of the saints. If he leaves off that habitation, if he leaves his first estate, the position that God put him in, and begins ministering in any way to fulfill himself, what are the pastors you fed yourselves? Okay, he led, then you're leaving your first estate, the first initial purpose why God gave you gifts and calling. So, what happened to the angels that left their first estate that sinned? Chains of darkness reserved unto judgment can't be redeemed. And, uh, you know, we like to put things in two categories. I like to put things in two categories. Um, what, uh, I'll, a couple of, uh, many times I'll preach about um, God is a swearing God. And to every person that ever exists, God will swear to you one way or another. He swore to Abraham saying, Blessing, I'll bless you. Multiplying, I'll multiply you. He swore to Abraham. Could swear by no greater. So he swore by himself. He swore by an oath. He made a solemn promise and said, I will bless you. I will save you. Once God swears, can, it go, can you go back? No, it's, it's a done deal. 
It merely needs to be manifested from there on in. But if you are wicked and you don't follow after the righteousness of God or misuse grace or whatever or break the covenant, then God says, I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So God's going to swear. Swear to bless you. Swear his wrath upon you. Now it's the same thing here. God knows how to preserve the righteous. And He knows how to reserve the wicked unto damnation. So everybody, everybody that exists, God will either preserve or reserve. If He's preserving, obviously, He's maintaining in a good, good condition preserved so it has life and use and value and he can keep it for himself preserving something right i see an old piece of wood out there i said think oh, well there's eight feet of that 14 foot board that's that's not rotten i am going to preserve it for my next carpentry project i will preserve it that means i'm gonna keep it i'm gonna use it it's gonna do a function and have a value to me but reserved means there's no intention of keeping it. Yeah. They are reserved in chains of darkness. So you look at the imagery, you have a chain. Every chain has multiple links. All right, so what this represents is it represents a council, a doctrine, a scripture, a spiritual, scriptural idea, a precept, a concept. And it's linked to another concept. And it's linked to another concept. It's a chain of darkness. It's a whole progression of counsels that sear and blind the conscience. So it's not just a simple matter of going up to a person like that and telling them in a moment, in a conversation, or in a statement and convincing them of anything. Because they have a whole chain of counsels. All chained together. And God does that to reserve them. To just keep them in that state until judgment. Reserved unto judgment. Decision's already been made. He's just reserving them. Are we preserved or are we reserved? God has, is going to swear to us. Is he going to swear to you like Abraham? Or is he going to swear to us like the children in the wilderness? They, I swear they will not enter into my rest. So it... It always polarizes to one of two things with God. It always polarizes to one of two things. All right. Whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. I read that scripture. Thou shalt have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And we've covered this over and over again. But, uh, you know, the man that gets angry at his brother and has, yeah, without cause and then has a, a fleeting thought like, I'd just like to kill that guy and I'd be done with him. And then says, good Lord, what a, what an extreme thought. I'm sorry, Lord. That's, uh, that's really over the top. I repent. I take that thought captive, bring it obedience into obedience. Okay, and, and, but the other guy doesn't. He, in fact, every time he gets mad at something, he just takes his bat and hits him and kills him. It's like, you don't think there's a difference in judgment between those two things? You don't think there's a difference in judgment between a man who abuses authority to be sexually perverse for years and years and years on end, and then he tries to compare himself to a man who may have had the fleeting lustful thought for a woman? Do you, you really think those two are the same? He that delivered me unto thee hath the... Yeah. Do you think it's the same? David commits adultery with Bathsheba and Hophni and Phinehas repeatedly, systematically abuse authority to defile women continually. You think there's a difference there? There's a difference. So we can't look at sin like uh, w whether you uh, have a bad thought or whether you commit the deed, uh, we're all equally culpable or what have you, because it just doesn't work that way. There is There is one context you can look at it like that, if people are in denial of sin, of course, it doesn't matter whether you commit the little sin or the big sin. We're all guilty before God, right? So we can't claim our sense of self-righteousness by comparing degrees of sin because degrees of sin don't matter in that case. 
concerning our guiltiness before God, but concerning how God deals with us, concerning the degree and manner of judgment upon us for the sin, it, it's vastly different. It takes circumstance into account. It takes the state of the individual into account. You know, what has this individual attained unto? What has he had opportunity to have received from the power of God and the Word of God? Has he tasted the power of the ages to come and he's still sinning? Or has he not tasted the power of the ages to come and he needs time to work it out? Right? I mean, judgment is a thing like, it's a balance. It has many different weights, many different measures that go into the balances of judgment. He that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. You know, you cannot say uh, the psychopathic man without a conscience who ruthlessly uh, rapes and sodomizes young boys and chops them up into pieces and buries them in his backyard. You can't say that man is the same as somebody who had an angry thought against his brother and brought a captive. It's just, it's, they're not equal. They're not the, not the same. One is greater than the other. You understand? He that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. When Stephen was stoned, and he kneels down and he cries with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Which sin do you think he was talking about? The personal sin of him being stoned. Don't charge them. They're stoning me. The act of murdering his fleshly body don't lay that sin to his charge. If those guys don't repent, <laughs> right, and then they don't come to know the Lord, and then they stand before him on judgment day, you think they're going to be culpable? God's going to charge them with something. They're going to charge, charge him with uh, rejecting the uh, message of the Holy Ghost that was offered through Stephen now. Now, maybe God will forgive them for the act of murdering him, his flesh, but not for the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, that part of it. Now, there's lots of things that men are going to be forgiven of, even men that aren't saved. All, all manner of sin and blasphemy with us, however men shall blaspheme, shall be forgiven unto men. But you will not be forgiven for neglecting salvation or for ignoring the call of God. Right? You, you, just, you won't be forgiven for that. That's not why God's going to damn you. This is the condemnation. Men love darkness rather than light. Light has come into the world. Men love darkness rather than light. Men would not come to the light. And we all know about that too. Okay. Um, I'm going to have a look at Romans 6 and then I'll probably end it there. In Romans chapter 5 actually. There is things to be said about sin, transgression, and iniquity. Yeah, Thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. The selfish, iniquitous the couldn't give a darn about anybody else, the blind, ambitious, deliberated pursuit of my sin that didn't consider God or my brother or anything else. This is just wicked and selfish and perverse. Yeah, God can even forgive that. But remember, we, we gave criteria about that. We gave conditions about iniquity. You have to get the guile out of your spirit. Blessed is he whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is forgiven covered, whose iniquity is hidden, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute iniquity, in whose spirit is no guile. So if you had guile, you have to drop the guile and the deceit. You have to be in a condition of no guile and no deceit. All right. Uh, Wherefore is by one man sin entered to the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For unto the, till the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. So God did not impute the sin, because there is no law. Because sin is the transgression of the law. And through the law is the knowledge of sin, and so how do they know they're sinning? Because in their conscience they have nothing to compare their actions to. So they can't know. So, it was not imputed, and nevertheless, death, they all still died, didn't they? Death reigned from Adam to Moses. Even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. And the similitude of Adam's transgression is Adam had a commandment, and he knew it was a revealed will of God, and they still were deceived, beguiled into transgressing, transgressing it by believing 
the lying fundamental counsel of lie, you shall not surely die, which emboldened them to commit the action of sin and bring forth the evil fruit, the evil deed, the revolt against God and the authority of what God had told them. So, not as the offense, so also as the free gift. If through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and, by the, and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded on the many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is, is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive the abundance of grace, not everybody, but those who receive the grace, those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Now look at that. If the justification came unto all men, then are all men saved? Just keep that in mind. Remember when, when the kingdom of God is like a man who found a pearl of great price or he found treasure in a field. He got so excited about it, he went and sold all he had and bought that field. The treasure is us, the elect of God. We are the planting of the Lord. There's wheat and tares. Who sowed these? An enemy sowed the tares. Well, who sowed the wheat? Father planted the wheat. Yeah, every plant that my father hath not planted, right? So we have been planted in the world. We are his treasure. We have been planted by the father in the world. Lots of people are in this world. They were planted not by the father. They were planted by Satan. They're tares. So Jesus sees us as a treasure in the world. But the world, the dominion of the world is under Satan. As he got Adam to submit to him and sold out under Satan. Now we're sold under sin. Satan is the god of this world. He has the whole darn field now. But I got my treasure in the field. Now some of that's treasure and some of it is the evil one sowed them. I'm not interested in what the evil one sowed. I'm interested in getting that treasure out of the, out of the field. But the devil owns the whole darn world, so I'm going to have to buy the whole field. Yeah. You understand? And then I'm going to have to draw it in and keep that which is good and cast the bad away, right? The king of the gospel is like a magic, cast the net in, and it brought in everything, bad and good. Then he takes the bad and casts it away and keeps the good. And I always put it in an allegory. I'm a plumber, and I go to a garage sale, and some old plumber has all his old plumbing stuff in a great big box. And he's the owner of the box. And he says, entire box, $150. And I look in there and I say, boy, there's some rotten pieces of copper pipe. No good to me. Oh, wait, look, there's a great big two-inch copper T fitting. Wow, that would be worth 75 bucks if I had to buy it in the store. Oh, look, there's another. Look at that. There's a, there's a torch in there that I could use. Oh, I see some treasure in there. Oh, there's another fit, fitting that's rotten. I'd, no good to me. It's full of good stuff and it's full of junk. But yet it's all in one box. And the owner of the box says... No, nope, you got to buy the whole box. So what do I do? If, I, if, it's, if it's a treasure to me, I buy the whole darn box, I take it, dump it on my counter, and I keep the good stuff and I throw the bad stuff away. All right, so you see. So when the Bible talks about Jesus, a uh, free gift com comes upon all men unto justification of life, it means he paid for the potential for that to happen. Just like he is a propitiation for our sins and not for our sins also, but all for the sins of the whole world. The Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. Is the whole world saved? No. Contrary, the few there be that find it. So as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so grace may reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So then how then does grace reign unto eternal life? How then does grace reign to eventually obtain eternal life? Through righteousness. Amen. See, well, what does through righteousness mean? Through I'm righteous because I think Jesus was the Son of God and nothing else is required of me? Yeah, we know that. We know it's not true. 
Righteousness. He that doeth righteousness. Doeth. Doeth. Is of God. He that committeth sin. Does actions and deeds of sins. He's of the devil. Sin reigns unto death. Even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Now Paul in chapter 6 is going to clarify something here. This doesn't mean we're off the hook. This doesn't mean nothing's required in our flesh. It doesn't mean we're saved by grace and grace alone. It doesn't mean we're saved because we believe and have a thought in our mind or an assent in our mental conscience or we embrace some concept of faith or we have a, a, an acknowledgement of something Jesus did and that's all we have to do is think about it and esteem it to be true in our minds. And Paul is saying, no, that's, we're going way beyond that here. He clarifies it. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? How are you going to, if uh, you're dead to sin, how, how are you going to live in sin, in the motions and actions and deeds of sin? Remember, because that's what the fruit is. The final result of the tree is the fruit, the action, the deed. That which you taste. I mean, if, if I, can you taste anything from me ministering or can I taste anything from you ministering to me? If I just stay in, in my closet and you all come here and I don't say anything, I don't do any actions, I don't speak any words, nothing comes forth in my thrust. This is fruit. This is fruit. Yeah. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father even so we should also we should also walk in newness of life. Not just gives the consideration that the penalty has been taken away. No, we are to walk act speak Live, breathe, do, work, perform, have our lifestyle, walk in this newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. <laughs> Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. We do, we're do. we not here to serve sin. What the Bible say? The body is for the Lord. The whole essence of worship is whose image gets to be manifested in the flesh. What's the mystery of godliness? God is manifested in the flesh. What's the mystery of iniquity? Iniquity is manifested in the flesh. So it all boils down to what's going on in your flesh. Oh, God doesn't care what happens in the flesh. Oh, you better believe he does. <laughs> you better believe he does. He that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but that in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, and I've covered this before, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead unto sin but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. When you reckon yourselves dead unto sin, you're dead to it. It means your fleshly body does not have to respond or react or yield to or fulfill what sin is trying to get you to do. Reckon that you are dead to it. Yeah. That's the mindset you carry. Now, no one's saying you're going to be 100% successful all the time as you're coming unto perfection. We all know that. But this is how you reckon. This is how you consider it. This is how you embrace it. No. You know, it's just like people will say, uh, they'll, pray, they'll get prayed for healing and there's no manifestation of the healing. Well, don't you go around and you say, no, I reckon I'm healed even though I don't see the manifestation because by His stripes I'm healed. I reckon I am healed. And then you carry a mindset not to try to take uh, worldly provisions and sorcery and stuff for whatever your ailment is, mm -hmm. if you're really pursuing the faith and all. Well, so, but you have to start with the mindset that you are 
reckon that you are dead to sin. Now, we talked about this. If if you say, well, you know, the sin nature is always going to be in you, and you, 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 it's inevitable, you can't stop it. You know, the leper can't change his spots, so just resign yourself to the fact that you're going to sin. Is that reckoning yourself dead to sin? No, that's reckoning that you're going to have to reckon that you're alive to sin. See, so it's exactly contrary to the instructions of the Apostle of Grace, Paul. All right, let not sin. And here's the crowning crowning scripture to, to clarify, confirm all of this. Reckon yourselves to be dead unto sin, alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies, that you should obey it in the lusts thereof. And another scripture I've been throwing into all this, abstain from less fleshly lusts that war against your soul. Neither yield ye your members. Well, what does he mean by members? Your hands, your feet, your nose, your mouth, your ears, your eyes, your legs, your, your speech, your... Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. So here's the word sin, singular, in reference to actions and deeds that take place in your flesh that you should not supposed to yield to. Do not let these actions take place in your mortal body. Don't yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Right? So it's not talking about just a state of unbelief or belief. It's talking about sin as actions and deeds. Don't yield your members to sinful actions and deeds. Yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of, of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. In other words, that's in, sin shall not have dominion over you is in reference to everything I just said about actions and deeds, not letting sinful actions and deeds take place in your flesh because sin shall not have power and dominion over you to make you do sinful actions and deeds. It doesn't mean sin shall not have dominion over you and no longer has the power to kill you or bring a penalty upon you. Well, it's that as well, obviously. But it really is in reference to for actions and deeds in your flesh. For you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. God forbid. Know you not to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Yielding yourselves. We're talking more about thoughts and what not. We're talking more about more than about spirit and thoughts and concepts and what have you. You're yielding yourselves servants to obey his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin or the death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, and the Corinthians says, and such were some of you, but now you are washed, now you are cleansed, now you've been justified, now you've been empowered, now you have overcome by the power of God, now you have understanding, you've tasted the powers of the ages to come, if so be you actually have, you know. God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart. That's a key, right? You have to do this from your heart. It has to be something that comes up out of your heart after God having dealt with you through a series of afflictions and operation and everything else, a baptism. You have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. So what's the doctrine about? Purity, holiness, perfection, righteousness in your mortal bodies, not by the deeds of the law, but by a righteousness and a power that comes from the Holy Ghost. And you know it's not your own, because God has prepared your heart and taught your heart. It's so the righteousness that comes from within. Nevertheless, the law is not done away with. The law is fulfilled. Amen. It's performed. It's demonstrated in your mortal bodies. Amen. It's like we said it before. I know a man who could, uh, a man can commit adultery, and uh, find a place of repentance and uh, be saved. Okay, right? A man can commit adultery and never repent because his conscience is seared and he does it all his life and never finds a place of repentance, and that man goes to hell. Another man never commits adultery because uh, it's against his religion and he would like to, and his heart was burning to commit adultery, but he never gets cleansed. But somehow through circumstance, he doesn't have the opportunity, and through self-will, he just keeps himself 
from committing adultery under a false pretense, not necessarily in any honor to God. And so he never commits adultery, but he goes to hell. Because his heart dies with the potential to be adulterous. Never got cleansed and purged from all unrighteousness. And another man doesn't commit adultery because he's come through an operation of God. He's actually walking with Jesus Christ and he's overcome sin and flesh and the devil. And he's now empowered by God. And he does not commit adultery because the righteousness of God that is, comes forth out of his heart, that spiritual issue of the righteousness of Jesus Christ comes forth. And the fruit of his flesh as a result of that empowerment is not to commit adultery, not to lie, not to bear false witness, not to covet. To remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. To honor father and mother. To not bow down any graven images. All that stuff is kept by nature. What do I do to inherit eternal life? Keep the commandments. Which ones? The Ten Commandments. Keep them. Keep them. Keep them. <laughs> to enter an eternal life, keep the commandments. Keep the commandments. God has not done away with the law. Not one jot or tittle has been done away with. Till you are perfected, or all is fulfilled. And what does God do when you're perfected? Takes you, takes you home. The tree then falls, you die, you fall asleep, you're ready. God harvests you, He takes you. Good fruit. God be thanked, you were the servants of sin, now you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered for you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Now you were made free from sin. Again, what? What does that mean? Free from sin. Free from the consequence? No. It means you became free that you don't have to commit the actions and deeds of sin. Right? So if I'm really embracing the purity and holiness of God and I want to do what's right, then I'm in some kind of bondage. I'm like the woman in adultery. And John, what was it, chapter 8, or whatever, wherever it was. Then after God's done with me, it's like I said, he had come to say to me, well, go. I'm not going to condemn you now because you've struggled, you've embraced holiness, you tried it yourself, found out you couldn't do it, you cried out to me. You understand all this stuff now, I've prepared your heart, now I'll get, I will set you free from that bondage and I'll let my righteousness do in you what you wanted to do all along. Not commit adultery. Go and commit adultery no more, just as you so desired to do for so long, but weren't able to. Go and sin no more. Right? And uh, he that doeth righteousness is righteous. How do you know man's righteous and godly? By their fruit, by what he does. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Okay, I speak after the manner of men. Let me go back. So, being made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness. There it is again. Let's pay attention to Romans chapter 6. How many times he talks about your members, the individual parts of your body, yielded to perform the actions and deeds of either sin, unrighteousness, or the nature of Christ, righteousness. It's all in the deeds that we may be receive for the things that we believed in our minds, no, that we may receive for the things done in our body. Your works. You know, these have, we have people who have fallen asleep in the Lord and their works do follow them. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. If you, you have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now, yield your members, servants, to righteousness unto holiness. And let's extend it uh, by extension, purity, virtue, purity. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. When you're the servant of sin, you weren't doing what was righteous. You were free from it, unable to let that control you. So what fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? It's sad to say some people aren't, aren't even ashamed of those things that still do them, right? And we, we're, we're the generation that are, are, are intensely seared in our conscience. The end of those things is <clears throat> death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit. What did we say fruit was? 
yeah, you have your fruit unto holiness. What what's fruit again? The deeds, the actions of your body. Remember the tree. The root is in the heart. The spirit comes out of the heart. The issue out of the heart are the issues. Where does that issue go? It comes out of the heart. It comes into your body, your flesh, and when it comes into your body and into your flesh. It performs an action and a deed, and the action and the deed is the final result. There you go. Apple tree. What's the final result? The apple. The fruit. The fruit is your deeds. So, being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness, and the end of that is everlasting, everlasting life. All right. Praise the Lord. Sin, transgression, and iniquity. I'll just ask you to start, kind of keep it in mind, because I might pursue it, Lord willing. I might kind of pursue that idea. It's probably something that we're going to have to do repeatedly under a number of times because I'm sure it's going to take a while to break down each word and, and sort of give examples and everything. But then to summarize it, sin is like a, is like a, uh, an offense of some sort. Transgression introduces the idea of self-will and rebellion breaking from authority. Iniquity begins to talk about the... Um, the um, escalation into perverseness, perverseness and wickedness and selfishness, and which which gives way to the idea of being blinded to your effect on everybody else by the blindness of yourself, seeing things yourself, creating blindness, uh, searing of conscience. Iniquity abounds, the love of many waxes cold, because love does not seek its own, but iniquity seeks its own, it's blind to the needs of others. You can go on and on, okay? Those are the basic concepts there. All right, God bless you, I'm done.